comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 15 through 29. Brothers and sisters, I give an example from daily life. Once a person's will has been ratified, no one adds to it or annuls it. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, as of many, but it says, and your offspring. That is one person who is Christ. My point is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise, but God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring would come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now, a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came. We are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. Let me go back for a second. I skipped a line. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Jesus Christ you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Earlier in life, I was an aquatics professional for the Royal Life-Saving Society of Canada. In those younger days, I, was spent, I spent a lot of my time training other lifeguards, teaching children how to back crawl, coordinating first aid trainings, and then in my spare time, I was standing next to a pool on a warm summer day at a summer camp. I used to love those days. Standing by the poolside, kids splashing in the cool water, the warm sun above me. Now, as young people are prone to do, I thought myself an authority as I was in that role of supervisor of all things aquatic. I stuck to my guns, and I enforced rules with military-like rigidity. Were you running on the pool deck? Time out. Were you diving in the shallow end? Time out. Did you splash me? Time out. I held these rules for a reason. I held these rules because they were for the safety of everyone involved. On one of these weeks at this camp, I was asked to be the first aid staffer for a wilderness excursion. A group of 15 leaders and kids were going to be canoeing down a river, camping on the riverside, roughing it all week long. It ended up being a fantastic week. I loved the experience. Lots of silly times in the river, lots of water, lots of splashing. But I didn't realize until afterward how much I had missed. Throughout the week, I spent every moment living into that role of rule enforcer. There are a lot more hazards, after all, when you're on the river. The water moves fast, the Grand River sweeps along, and you can get swept along in that as well. 
life jacket checks, ensuring people had sunscreen and were drinking water, reminding the boys that sticks were not swords, and reminding the girls that rumors do not help anyone. I kept my eyes open for any rule-breaking that could have been happening. At the end of the week, our group sat together in a circle, and we shared our favorite moments of the week. And as we went around the circle, I realized that I had missed most of those special moments. The bald eagle that was soaring overhead. The white-tailed deer that were along the river one day. The beauty of the bluff against the river. The beauty of the quiet waters going by our boats. I had missed most of these moments because I wasn't paying attention to them. Instead, I was focused on keeping the rules. At the end of the week, my goal was achieved. Everyone returned home safely, but I had missed out on the journey that we had all taken together. In a way, our passage tonight is Paul's warning to the Christians of Galatia that they're missing out on something, missing out on the journey and the ultimate goal in the way that they are upholding their version of the faith and Jewish laws. The Jewish Christians were telling the Gentiles, the non-Jewish Christians, that in order to officially be accepted into the Christian community, they had to be circumcised, something that was very much part of the old school Jewish traditions, based on laws that were put forth by Moses in the book of Exodus. The people were trying to keep those rules, uphold those laws that were a part of the culture, a part of the Jewish traditions that they were in. Paul came along to remind them about the true intent of the law and what was more important in this place. He starts by taking it back to the original promise, the promise that God made with Abraham. The promise that God gave to Abraham is as, as the covenant between God and God's people could be traced. Through that covenant, the people of Israel, the people of God, were given the promise that as Abraham's offspring, they were considered God's people. Paul says, however, that the promise that was made with Abraham's offspring by the letter of the words was actually made to Abraham's offspring, singular. To Abraham's offspring, meaning that one person, Jesus Christ. Now, as followers of Christ who have put their faith in him, we receive our share of that promise, that original promise through Abraham, through Christ. As we put our faith in Christ, we then become shareholders in that promise. With the old understanding of the promise, the people had to follow a list of rules and expectations, regulations, that would set them apart as God's people. And as they followed those rules, they believed then they were given a part of that promise through Abraham. They followed laws that were written down during the time of Moses, some 430 years after the original promise with Abraham was made, Paul says. But Jesus, Paul says, is the true recipient of that promise. Through Christ, through faith in Christ, we are given an opportunity to participate in that. Through Christ and with faith that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit in Christ and by the symbolism of our baptism, that symbolism that clothes us in the identity of Christ, we are adopted, adopted into that family and then seen as heirs of this promise with Christ. To step away from all of those words, it's simply that the promise of salvation here is no longer dependent on the rules that we follow. It is a grace-filled experience that comes from being baptized in Christ. Christ, who is the holder of that covenant and promise. What we do no longer has impact upon our role, our receiving of that promise. 
There is joy in that. There is a simplicity in that. There's ownership of it, and there is life in that promise. Paul wants the Galatians and us to realize that the law, which is helpful, is not the basis of salvation. The law acts as a guideline within which we should act to help us stay on track toward the promise. However, it is not that list of check marks that we must achieve in order to be given that promise. John Calvin, an early Reformation theologian, talked a lot about the law and its function in our lives as Christians. He talked about the law and its function in that it's not something that should constrain us. Rather, it's more like boundaries within which we can have the freedom to live, knowing that what we do within these boundaries will be glorifying to God. He also reminded those that were reading his commentary on the book of John a very important thing about salvation and law. The law holds all under its curse, he said. From the law, therefore, it is useless to seek a blessing. Laws never bless anyone. They only restrain and punish, they, they correct, they corral, but you will not receive a blessing from a law. To live by the law without realizing the blessing that that law is protecting is like living within the rules but not seeing the creation that is around you. If you think about a marriage, a marriage between two people, if these partners live only by one rule of marriage, say monogamy, if they live solely focused on that rule, they're missing out on a lot. They're focused on that one piece of a marriage and yet missing the beauty of the relationship that comes with that. If we focus on only the rules, we miss out on the blessing that is in the promise that we receive. So what's the answer then? Should we throw out all the laws and the guidelines? Do we just live recklessly dwelling on the promise and not realizing the consequences that could come by not living, following the laws? Not, not really. I'm never going to say that from a pulpit. We need to abandon the labels and limitations of the law, however. Living into that promise that we receive as children of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. In that, we are the recipient of the promise of salvation, of eternal life. God's people are called to be moral people. We do need to act like children of God. The letter of the law, however, should not be a condemning letter. It should be a guiding one. The real focus needs to be on who we are as recipients of that promise of salvation. Under the law, we are given a list of labels. We are identified as rule breakers, we're identified as those that are following the rules or not following the rules. As we look through the laws, we are identified with different roles as the head of a household or not. We're identified as slaves or free. We're identified as liars or not, adulterers, those that have been corrected, those that are in the right, those that are wrong. However, in the promise of salvation, we are marked in a different way. We are clothed in Christ. We are given a new symbol. We are the recipients of salvation. We are followers of Christ. We are accepted. We're no longer slave nor free. We're no longer Jew or Greek. We're not even male or female. Rather, every single one of us is seen as one in Christ, saved, redeemed, an heir of the promise. So go, therefore, living into that promise, embracing the promise of salvation in Christ. You are no longer marked, you're no longer condemned. In Christ, 
you are free. Amen.